All right, let us get into our talk tonight, Rural Tales and Cooking Up Rural Goodness. And we're talking again about the rural people, learning their wisdom, some of their sayings, some of their adages. We're going to explore their cooking and life on the land as Pino and I lived in starting 1975. This photo was taken during the wheat harvest of our neighbors who lived on the farm next to us. You can see Pino there in the lower right hand corner. He's got a headband on to keep the sweat off his face as he was out scything the uh, wheat. Next to him is Marino in the white shirt and the hat and holding the red wine. You met him in my talk last week along with his wife, Karina. Karin is the woman up there standing with a headscarf. She's off to the left. And in my talk last week, we learned about how the farm people made brooms of the yellow broom that grows in the fields in the springtime. We'll be seeing yellow broom again tonight. There's another gentleman with a wine bottle up to the right. Well, work would start at 530 in the morning. And all day under the oak tree in the shade was a bottle of wine, a bottle of water. I don't, maybe we had one glass that we all just shared. And uh, the drinking went on all day. Nobody drinking too much, but the wine was important for the sugars you needed for the energy. A lot of food was served too. We'll be talking about that. And the water for full hydration. So this is a photo of 1976. Now, we're going to continue with our discussion of the rural year and rural goodness. And if you remember, in some of you were here for the last talk, we talked about the making of the pig, the slaughter of the pig, the rural tasks of the wintertime, all the way up to Easter, and the making of the cheese breads and the outdoor bread oven. So around Easter and springtime, this is the time to go out to the fields for wild chicory and wild field greens. We check for these wild field greens in autumn as well as in spring. And here's our dear farm neighbor, Peppa. She's up at our house. We were going up the hill together to find some wild chicory. And she said, oh, first I have to stop and see Chicho and Peepo, the two donkeys of Pino. So we stopped to say hello to the donkeys, Peepo and Chicho. And then we continued on the search for the wild field greens, chicory especially. Here's Peppa on the left. She's just cut a nice bunch. In the photo in the center, you can see the wild chicory. And on the right, she's washing the wild chicory in a bucket at one of our front doors. The washing probably will be in at least three buckets of water. The chicory is all washed when you lift the bunches up and there are no grains of dirt left in the water. Then it's time to boil it. A favorite meal of Umbrian rural cuisine, the Cucina Umbra Rurale, is la torta con cicoria, that delicious heart bread baked also on the top of the fireplace, stuffed with chicory, a slice of pecorino cheese near it, and you can see the pecorino. All the farmers had sheep. So they all would make sheep's milk cheese, pecorino. We did too. Many years ago, we had about five sheep. We don't have the sheep anymore. We have about 18 goats. So in springtime, Pina will make goat cheese and we'll see him tonight doing that. And you can see the chicory there and then a grilled sausage. And as you know, if you were present at the last talk, all the farmers have their sausages, salami, prosciutto, capocolo, hanging in their cellars. It's the task that is kind of universal on the farms in January when the weather's cold. And they'll have their vino rosso. Uh, last year, it was fall, and I was going up to the back fields to pick uh, some chicory and field greens, and I walked up with Pino, left him at the donkey pen. There is his beloved Chicho, and I was out on the fields gathering chicory and other field greens. So we just call them generically Erba Campagnola, greens of the countryside. There are many types. And the farm women taught me, as you can see in the photo on the left, as you pick the greens, you save yourself a lot of work if you immediately eliminate from the bunch blades of grass, cut away the mud, the root. It's going to be less work when you get back to the house if you do some cleaning of the greens right there on the field. 
When you have your basket almost full of the greens, it's time to go back to the house for the washing. This is the field adjacent to our house. And you can see our farmhouse here, restored by Pino, certainly not what it looked like in 1975. And some of you know, because you were able to join me in one of my first talks, Rural Life Revisited, we had pictures of the old farmhouse. The greens in the foreground with the white flowers are wild. They are not, however, edible. Uh, edible and enjoyed by our donkeys and our goats. But no, these are not greens that will be used in the cooking. So into the house, it's time to wash the greens and finish cleaning them. So I just put them all out on the table and the ones on the right on the table have not yet been cleaned. The ones in the blue bucket I have cleaned and what have I done? I've um, checked them for blades of grass that might be, you know, hidden in the in, in amongst the leaves and cut off the mud and around the root. And then the blue bucket uh, I took into the kitchen. I probably filled it three or four times with water until it was all clean. And guess what? We have a bucket in our kitchen. And what we do when we're rinsing vegetables is we save that water. And it's used to water our plants. We're very strong about conserving water. And as I'm cleaning the greens on the stove in the kitchen, a pot of water is boiling in which I'm going to cook these field greens. That pot will be three quarters full of water. Chicory is extremely bitter, so you can't just steam it. You have to cook it in boiling water. Since it's bitter, Oh, it's so good for the health. I would like to read you in Italian. It's kind of fun to hear the Italian. A direct quote from Peppa about the benefits of chicory. These are words of Peppa. La chicoria fa bene per la circolazione. Purifica il fegato. Fa bene contro il colesterolo alto. Aiuta a digerire e riempie la pancia. The chicory is good for the circulation. It purifies the liver. It's good against uh, cholesterol. It will keep your cholesterol down. It helps you digest and it fills your stomach. And the farm woman used to tell me these things as we picked the field greens, you know, how nutritious and everything it was. And I was thinking all the time, these farm women seem to know as much as a doctor. Guess what I did recently? I checked up chicory on the internet. And I found that actually what Peppa had told me was quite true of chicory. It will keep cholesterol down. It's great for digestion. It's very good for the liver and so forth. I checked it up in Italian on the internet and I was, I just said, oh, they're doctors. I knew they were. And why are they in such good health? And another thing Peppa told me is um, the chicory would keep away la miseria. In other words, poverty. We ate it during times of miseria. That is when we had nothing. And she said, sometimes for dinner we would have bruschetta. Well, bruschetta is all the rage now in gourmet restaurants. You know what bruschetta is? It's toasting your bread when it's hard. So you don't have to throw it away. And then you rub it with garlic and olive oil. It's poor man's food, bruschetta. She said, sometimes when I was little, dinner would be simply bruschetta and chicory on the side. But, and she said, it would fill your tummy. So while the water is boiling, I'm dicing three garlic cloves because I am going to saute those garlic cloves in an excellent extra virgin olive oil. This is actually our olive oil because I took this photo last year. In this same container this year is Keegan's olive oil because some of you know we had a very hard freeze this year and then drought and we had no olives on our hundred olive trees this year. So we too are grateful for, to Keegan for olive oil. And you saute without burning, so you want the heat low, garlic and in the olive oil, and I add sometimes a chunk of red pepper. So garlic, oil, and hot red pepper. Aglio, olio, pepperoncino. These three foods are a great combination to put on spaghetti. 
Sometimes in a Rome restaurant, people go in and oil pasta with aglio, olio, peperoncino. It's absolutely delicious. And then you drain the chicory when it's cooked and look at that color. It still must be a bright green. It's not going to cook for more than a couple minutes. When you pull a leaf and it comes away from the bunch, it's cooked. You're going to slide it right away into a colander and then slip it into the olive oil in which you sauteed garlic. And you just slip it in, stir it around, take it out quickly. We would call this, what I'm doing is making la chicoria saltata. Saltata means jumped. So it's just a quick toss in the olive oil and garlic. And then when I took these photos I'd made for dinner that night, uh, some of our, it was a simple dinner, simple rural dinner, hard boiled eggs from our chickens. Look at those yolks. And drizzled with olive oil, a squeeze of lemon juice, sprinkled with salt and pepper, and then I sprinkled on it oregano from the mountains of Sicily. So this is a wonderful, simple, easy, rural dinner. There you are. Hard-boiled eggs with olive oil, lemon juice, salt, and pepper, the torta umbra, or maybe delicious bruschetta, and la chicoria. Chicoria or chicoria and other greens together, and that we would call herba campagnola, field greens. Um, springtime is also the time of wild asparagus, which we find in our woods. So the chicory is a field green, and it's nourishment of the fields and the open air. But our woods also give us goodness, and that's the wild asparagus. And, you know, there's something about going into those woods for wild asparagus. You're itchy, you get sweaty, you get scratched up, uh, your legs and hands get pricked, but and you're scrambling up and down, but you come out of that woods and you're carrying a bunch of wild asparagus, and what bliss is that? This is me, wild asparagus hunting in 1976. <laughs> and the farm women took me into the woods with them and showed me where the wild asparagus was. And sometimes they would take bunches of wild asparagus to Assisi, to the open market. Now, our farm neighbors would walk to Assisi, to the open market. That's seven kilometers. And they'd have on their heads sometimes baskets of chicory eggs, bunches of wild asparagus, and these would be sold at the market, and guess what they would buy? Sugar and salt. <laughs> Foods they couldn't grow, because a lot of our farm neighbors like Chiarina and Marino, whom you've already met, they were mezzadri, that is sharecroppers. They got 52% of the yield of the land, and the landowner got 48%, and we're talking about how much land? Maybe 50 acres in the hills, non-irrigable. That means one hay cut a year, not three, because we don't have a huge water supply up here in the hills. You know, so it's just, you know, they lived in inventive ways. And so wild asparagus, sometimes the family wouldn't enjoy. Chiarina, we talked today on the phone. I said, how many times did you have a wild asparagus frittata when I was young? She said, wild asparagus frittata? My mother had to sell our eggs to buy the sugar. We didn't eat a lot of our eggs. And I noticed here, I was looking at that photo today and I was delighted to see, look at it, around it, I've wrapped a piece of stick or some greens. And the farm woman taught me how to do that. How they wrapped uh, uh, some strip of something from the woods, a branch or something around it to hold the asparagus. They wouldn't have had rubber bands, bows, strings. So they use things from the woods to hold the bunches together. Now, this is a recent photo of picking wild asparagus. And I didn't tie anything around it at all because I wasn't going to take it to the market to sell. I was going to turn it into something good. The farm people taught me years ago, when you go into the woods, you wear high boots. Because in the springtime, wild asparagus time is May or June, it's the time when the vipers, poisonous snakes, slither under rocks in the woods 
And when you're down picking wild asparagus down in your woods, they told me, you're going to have your hands down to pick the asparagus, and you don't want to meet a viper. Well, one year, it was just maybe a year ago, I went out for wild asparagus, so I said to our Marimano shepherd dog, Lamone, we have two, I said, come on, Lamona, you come with me, and you're going to go into the woods first. <laughs> so if there's any vipers in there, you can scare them away. Now, mind you, I have to tell you, in 50 years of looking for wild asparagus, I have never seen a viper. But I always did what they told me, high boots, and before I would lean down to pick the asparagus, I'd take a stick and wiggle it around in the woods, so if there was an animal, it would scare it away. So I said to Lamoni, you're going into the woods first for me, aren't you? And he looked at me as if to say, are you crazy? <laughs> Basically, he was telling me, I'm staying right here. And he just sat in the field outside and waited for me to come out of the woods with the asparagus. But one year... Another of our animals did come wild asparagus hunting with me, and that was my first sheep. This is my first sheep, Sophie. Photo is 1976, and she was my first birthday present from Pino when we lived on the land. So we moved to our farmhouse in September of 1975. My first birthday would have been August of 1976, and Pino brought, gave me as a gift my first sheep. We didn't have a lot of money. I laugh when I think of this. He got her at a very good price. And that is because she was old, lame, and arthritic. And Aldo, the shepherd, couldn't sell her to any of our farm neighbors because they were all intelligent enough to know that an old, lame, and arthritic sheep was bad investment. She turned out to be good investment. She was pregnant. And so uh, the, the following year or a few months later, a couple lambs were born. And here's her lambs. I named one of these lambs. Lampkins. I don't remember what the other was. But let's go back to Sophie. Okay, when we first had Sophie, she'd been separated from the herd to be sold. And sheep need to be with other sheep. So when I staked her out, and there was a long chain so she could wander around and eat grasses, all she did all day was bleat and mourn the fact that she was alone and she wasn't with the company of other sheep. So I used to let her off her chain and let her just roam. And then eventually she'd come back to the house. Well, one time I was down in our woods hunting wild asparagus and I heard her frantically bleating and trampling through the woods and crashing through the woods. She'd come looking for me because she didn't want to be alone. None of the other farm friends of mine have ever been accompanied by a sheep when they went wild asparagus hunting. Sophie made history. She was talked about in the area as the sheep who went wild asparagus hunting into the woods. So after the asparagus would be picked, be turned into goodness for the table, you might put the tips into a pasta sauce. This is just made simply with tomato, a little garlic, onion, and pasta uh, tips of asparagus broken in at the end. I think I steamed them just before I added them. You may want to do this with garden asparagus and a tomato sauce. One of our favorite dishes was um, a wild asparagus in a wild asparagus spaghetti alla carbonara. And I have that recipe on my website and I think Rick is kindly going to put it into the chat room for everybody. Uh, but if you go on my website and go on the blog and just put in the word asparagus, you're going to find asparagus recipes and asparagus stories, including this recipe. You know that spaghetti alla carbonara is made sauteing a little bit of bacon and into the hot spaghetti just drained, you're whipping raw eggs, usually one egg for every two people. When I would make wild asparagus uh, carbonara, I would saute the asparagus tips with garlic, olive oil, and, and little pieces of our prosciutto. And then when the spaghetti was cooked, add in the eggs and then the asparagus. But that recipe we have on my website, and Rick will put it into the chat for us. 
Peppa often made risotto with her wild asparagus. And what lore she would share with me about the benefits also of the wild asparagus. And she advised me, Anna, just don't put it into eggs or onto pasta, but boil some of it and drink the water. And she said, Ottimi per i reni e la salute in genere. That means excellent for the kidneys and your health in general. I think you can see the word reni is kidneys. Think of our word renal, right? Of the kidneys. So this is the word for kidneys. Good for the kidneys. Once I learned to make pasta, there was no going back because the way to have our asparagus was often with homemade tagliatelle or fettuccine. Our farm neighbor Chiarina taught me to make pasta and I would roll it out on the marble top table. Some of you listening may have stayed in our Assisi apartments out here in the countryside. The apartment with three bedrooms has this huge table in the kitchen. It seats eight. And we found it in this old, our old farmhouse when we moved here. There were just a couple pieces of furniture and one was this table. And that marble top was an old butcher block. And there's nothing like marble for rolling out the pasta. I also learned from Chiarina, my farm neighbor who taught me how to make pasta, that when you make pasta, if you also have ducks, a couple duck eggs are good to add with your chicken eggs because they're much fattier. And in fact, duck eggs are high actually in cholesterol. But she said, don't put in too many duck eggs because your pasta will not be a nice bright yellow. Their yolks are not the deep orange of the chicken eggs. Our chicken's eggs are orange because they're free range chickens. You can see how simple was our kitchen. Behind me is my gas stove. It was two gas burners. Under them is the uh, gas tank that we'd uh, order. And I, I don't know how we picked it up. Maybe it was delivered in those days. I can't remember. And then behind me, one yard away, is the wood stove, which I use for cooking, but only in the winter, not in the summer. It would be too warm in the house. And then behind me, as I'm looking at it now, let's say behind the photographer would be the fireplace, which was our only source of heat, actually. And here I am feeding our chickens. This is 1976. Always had my head scarf on <laughs> because you're always carrying things on your head, too. If you can't carry things in your arms, you put them on your head and feeding the chickens and the turkeys. And we also had geese and we had ducks. And here's Pino and myself with our turkeys and turkeys and geese out for the day and then coming back in the evening, bringing them home. And one delicious dish to make with wild asparagus is a frittata, uh, a kind of flipped omelet. Of, this is called a frittata or flipped omelet of wild asparagus. And these videos were made very kindly for me some years ago, you can tell, um, but by a friend, Patrice, and she and her husband uh, were worked as videographers. His name is Arturo Zbica. And Arturo Zbica, I'd like to spell that. And Rick, maybe you could print this up. Zbica, S-B-I-C-C-A, has done some marvelous, marvelous videos. Also on the history of Assisi, St. Francis, uh, the Jewish refugees in World War II. Very talented. Uh, you want to look for his videos. I don't know if he's still producing them, but he's made some great ones. Zbica, S-B-I-C-C-A, Arturo but if anybody wants to write me also I can also let you know about it and Patrice made this this wild asparagus hunt the first part of making the asparagus frittata is of course finding the wild asparagus <laughs> and the wild asparagus will grow generally near woods and we have a little bit right here I'm pretty sure I can always find some right here we have good exposure to the Sun here so if I'm lucky, I'm going to find a few wild asparagus. And what I'll do is grab the plant, and this is the wild asparagus plant, and then I'll trace it all the way to the back to see the root. Go back to the where the asparagus starts, and I've got one. 
and here's one. And there should be more along here. Um, and this is a good thick one because sometimes you're only able to find little scrawny guys. But this looks like a good one. And there could be another one back here. It's a good one too. This is a wild asparagus plant. This sprouted last year. So this is very young. It's a light green. This is a dark green piece. This has been here for years. And it looks like, oh, we've got, there should be more in here. So I push it all the way down, go back to the base, and see if anything is sprouting out of the, of the roots. Here I've got one. One thing you have to be very willing to do when you hunt wild asparagus is get very scratched up. It's not for the faint of heart hunting wild asparagus. And so all you need is a few to make an omelet. You need a lot more if you're gonna make pasta with wild asparagus or risotto. So now we can go into the house and make a frittata di asparagi. Now we're going to make the asparagus, and the first part of making the asparagus frittata, of course, is picking up the asparagus, as we've seen. Then what we're going to do is break the asparagus, starting from the tip, into small pieces, and you break it all the way down. When it no longer snaps, discard that piece, pick up the up, next one, and break it as long as it snaps. Now, what the Umbrian farm women often do is if they don't have enough asparagus, they're going to go out and pick vital, which is a plant that steps can be added and used in place of the asparagus, and the flavor is very much like that of the asparagus. So I also have just a few vital tips to add in. They grow as a wild vine all over the place, and what's interesting, is they sort of some, seem to have a symbiotic relationship with the asparagus. Wherever you have asparagus, you also have vital Okay, now we'll rinse them. And just a, a quick and easy rinse. And then, this is our own olive oil from our trees, which we pick uh, in November. We pick the olives. They're pressed in Assisi at the olive mill in the town of Assisi. So I'm covering the bottom of a nonstick Teflon pan with the olive oil. And then I'm going to turn it on high. And what I'll do first is add one piece of asparagus. And that first piece is going to tell me when the oil is hot enough to add the others. And have a look at these eggs. Look at that yellow yolk, almost orange. These are organic eggs from our dear farm neighbor, Peppa. And of course, these are gonna be the best possible. You can't get these. Yes, we we didn't, what you weren't can. raising chickens. Eh? I would recommend always when you make a frittata to use organic you. eggs. I'm gonna put in, let's see, five, six is usually about the amount. And then just whip. The farm people would just, of course, use a fork. They're not going to bother with an egg beater. They're not going to bother with a whisk. But you can certainly, you know, whip the eggs with a whisk if you, if you prefer. Salt. It, the watchword to Italian cooking is QB, quanto basta. As much as you need. About that much salt. Maybe a little more. The trick is gauging your salt because we're going to add pecorino cheese to this as well. And that's quite salty. So I think the best way to make an, a, a frittata, especially an asparagus frittata, to which you'll add something like parmesan or pecorino, you're gonna have to experiment because it takes some trick to gauging the right amount of salt. When it starts sizzling, which it is now, it's time to put in the asparagus. Now I'm gonna show you a little trick that my Sicilian mother-in-law taught me. She will add a tablespoon of hot water and that, whenever she makes the frittata, and that will cause the vegetables to cook faster. And sometimes she'd cover the pan, sometimes not. I'm gonna let the water pretty much evaporate because I don't want too much water in the frittata. And then every cook has their favorite frittata pan. Mine is this old one. It's bent, it's decrepit. I've had it for 45 years. It was one of the first things we found in the farmhouse when we moved to our farm in Assisi. Our rent was $25 a month, no heat, no water, no electricity. And we just had a few old bits and pieces of this and that, a few odd things for the kitchen, and this was my frying pan lid, and it's still my frying pan lid. The important 
aspect of making a frittata, the most important step is flipping the frittata. And the lid has to be larger than the pan so you can flip it right over, but it has to be light enough that you can actually hold on to it. This is my frittata lid. I wouldn't know what to do without this. <laughs> it's unattractive as it is. It's best for me. But now it's about time to add the black pepper. The water is evaporated. Now I can put in the egg. And what I want to do now is bring the vegetables into the middle of the pan. I'm going to turn down the heat a little. So I could just, if I just move the asparagus here with a spatula, I can bring it to the center because this is a non-stick pan. So. Okay, now I'm going to turn it up again. And often my mother-in-law, Signora Vincenzo, would also add breadcrumbs that will absorb the egg. But in this case, I'm not going to because that'll detract too much from the flavor of the wild asparagus. So all I'm going to add to the wild asparagus frittata is pecorino cheese. And I have some right over here. Now I'm going to add grated pecorino cheese. And these are two fine pieces of pecorino from Umbria. This is a sheep's milk cheese. And I've already grated some. So now I'm going to put some here, sprinkle it across the frittata. I like pecorino with the asparagus. I prefer it to the Parmesan because pecorino has a nice bite to it. And now what I'm doing is lifting the frittata and letting the egg run down. And I have to cook all the liquid egg on the top before I can flip it. Frittatas can be made with some steamed Swiss chard, onions, uh, bell peppers. You might want to saute bell peppers with a bit of sausage. The Obrian sausage, of course, is perfect for that. If you make a frittata with tomatoes, you'd add the tomatoes now, just before the cheese, rather than putting it on the bottom in the hot oil. Okay. My trusty old frittata lid. And it's always recommended that you flip the frittata over the sink, especially because the first time's doing a frittata, it's likely that it's going to slide right off the lid and into your sink. It can be a mess. Okay, so here we go. I'm going over to the sink. And then it's a 180 degree turn immediately. This came out quite nicely. Now we're just going to slide it right onto the pan. Cook it one second on low heat, and it's done. Okay, before serving, you're going to flip it again, and then just slide it into the pan. And then the great thing about a frittata is you can serve at room temperature. I often make frittatas hours before the guests come. And in fact, I'm not going to cut it yet because it would fall apart. So I'll wait till it's cooled down before I'll cut it and then serve it. It can be a main course, it can be an antipasto, an hors d'oeuvre. Bon appetito. So there's your frittata recipe. And this is a frittata, I think it was last Easter. And it just coincided uh, asparagus time with Easter time because I think you might remember from my last talk and for those who weren't here, I mentioned Easter Sunday breakfast. It's very decadent here in Umbria. It's the cheese bread baked in the outdoor bread ovens, um, affettate, which would be slices of meat, salami, capocolo, and red wine. Can you imagine having that at 10 in the morning before you go to mass on Easter Sunday? And then generally hard boiled eggs with salt and olive oil, maybe a bit of lemon juice. But if it's asparagus season, that is if Easter coincides with wild asparagus time, even better, asparagus frittata. Now, what about people living in Assisi who crave the wild asparagus? They would just go to see Novella. She sells wild asparagus at her little vegetable stand in Assisi, and she is the end of a tradition. Why is she the end of a tradition? Because she's the last woman who's selling her vegetables and fruits on this little piazza of Assisi, where in the 1970s, 1980s, about 18 or 20 women were there with their fruits and vegetables. And now it's just Novella.
The population of Assisi has greatly decreased. People are moving away. Uh, fewer people are working the land. Farm women aren't walking six miles to Assisi to sell their wild asparagus at the markets as they were in the 70s and 80s. So now it's just novella. And it's springtime in this photo. You can tell she's got her cherries, her fava beans here in the foreground, just behind her fava beans. She has wild asparagus. And this woman has just bought some of her lettuce, which she's weighing. And this is that same piazza in the 1970s. The piazza is just off the main square of Assisi. It's called Piazzetta dell'Erba, which means the little square of the greens, where they sell greens, and not only greens, the salads and, and, you know, cabbages and so forth, but fruits, vegetables. Some of the women have their goods in baskets, which maybe their husbands wove for them. Others have them in crates. Others have them in boxes that also often maybe the husbands made for them. And I will tell you that when I first would do my shopping here in um, Assisi, it was the 70s and so so forth and I would always go there but what surprises for me when I started shopping there in 1979 in the fall I was pregnant with our son Keegan who was going to be born in 1980 well it was very difficult to shop there if you were pregnant because everybody would grab your hand and try to stuff into it an apricot, strawberries, these fruits that were costly, that farm women maybe not have on their farm, which they couldn't buy. And I'd say, no, thank you, but they'd give it to me anyway because they were afraid that maybe I was being polite, but I really wanted those strawberries. And there's a saying in Umbria, it's just wonderful. Tol you una volia, e levi una dolia. Take away a craving, and you take away a labor pain. In other words, if I was dying to have strawberries, and the vendor gave me strawberries, I would have less labor, fewer labor pains. And in fact, do you know what? A birthmark is called in, in Italian, it can be called a voglia. The farm people call a birthmark a voglia, a craving. Or they call it a fragola. They call it a strawberry. And our farm neighbor, Chiarina, I want to show her you right here. Chiarina first told me about the voglia, the dolie. And she told me, you know, when you go to the market, you're going to see if you're pregnant. And this is 1976. And this is Karina with her daughter, Rosanna. And she was telling me about this. I said, why were they trying to give me everything at the market? And she said, well, they were afraid that you probably wanted those apricots or you probably wanted the strawberries and, and maybe you couldn't afford to buy it and they wanted to give it to you. And, and, and I said, well, what if I wanted something and they didn't give it to me? And she said, oh, then your baby, Keegan, could have a birthmark. This was after Keegan's birth. And she said, Rosanna, come here. And she showed me. She lifted up Rosanna's dress. And she said, see that? It's a bunch of grapes. And the birthmark looked like a bunch of grapes. And I said, what happened? And she said, well, I was at the market. And out in our land, we had grapes. But at the market, there were these big white grapes, these green grapes, luscious. And she said, I must have said, oh, I love those and whacked my thigh. <laughs> and she said, Anna, she said, when the moon changes, it's even darker. And so after I heard about this Volya and the Dolye and getting a strawberry because you wish something, I went home and, um, or I guess it was months later, I was telling Peppa and she said, oh, see, si, see, si, eh, vero, eh, vero, it's so true. And she said, and do you know why so many um, Volye, she called them birthmarks, she called it so many desires, are brown? And I said, no. And she said, well... They probably wish they could have a porchetta sandwich. <laughs> and then she told me this story. This is the porchetta sandwich guy at the market, not the Assisi market, another market. 
And he's selling panini con la porchetta, which is an Umbrian delicacy, a roll with porchetta in it. And she said, oh, I remember the year. This woman in Assisi was out in Assisi doing her errands. Now, everybody, this would have been the late 70s, the early 80s when it happened. And she said she passed the porchetta stand and she said to the porchettaio, who's this gentleman here, oh, buona la porchetta. And he saw she was pregnant, so he immediately offered her porchetta sandwich. And she said, grazie, ate her porchetta sandwich and did her errands. <laughs> I can't believe this. And then she finished her errands and she was leaving Assisi and she passed the porchetta stand again. And she looked in it, she said, oh, it looks so good. And he said to her, Signora, I've already given you the porchetta sandwich. And I said to Peppa, well, so everything was fine. She said, Anna, that woman was carrying two children and only one lived. <laughs> and I said, oh, I'm so sorry. And she said, just think, with one porchetta sandwich, he could have saved the baby. <laughs> So this is the porchetta who should have given the two porchetta sandwiches. And I was telling this story to Emma and she cut my hair, in fact, the other day. And whenever we're when I'm there, she's just great. She's delightful. And we'll talk about stories of Umbria. So I was telling her this story of the the dolia and the volia. Here she's cutting my hair. She pulls her shirt off and she said, look at this. You see the brown spot right here on her shoulder? She said, my mother had a great desire for cafe latte when I was pregnant. <laughs> and I'll tell you, our son Keegan has a birthmark on his thigh. I don't know if I desired cappuccino and said something and smacked my thigh one day. But So this is a volia, it's called. Or it can be called a fragola, even if it's not in the shape of a strawberry. So another tidbit of rural lore. Now, Novella is still at Piazza dell'Erba, Piazza dell'Erba, selling her vegetables and also her flowers. Dear Bruno is no longer with us, but he used to take her there every day in their little scooter truck called the Bumblebee, the Ape, you know, those little buzz guys. And on the back, he'd have all her vegetables and he'd set her up at the market and then snip all her roses and get them ready for the selling of her roses. So there's Novella, proud of her asparagus. We never bought her asparagus because we used to hunt our own. There's Pino on an asparagus hunt with me. I found a good bunch that year. I think this is our daughter Julia out hunting asparagus in the woods, probably Guglielmo with her. They found a good amount of asparagus. Whenever they come up here in the spring, they'll take a half hour or so to head up for the woods to look for asparagus. There's our farm neighbor, Raul, and wow, he really knows the good spots for asparagus. Look at the bunch he came home with not too um, long ago. One day, I walked to a CZ, which is about seven miles from our house in the spring. I would do that now and then. And I did it one spring, especially because I wanted to look for asparagus on the way. So I was passing Giovanino's restaurant. This is Ristorante da Giovanino. Some of you listening may have been with me on my Rural Life Revisited tour. We started Giovanino's re uh, little restaurant coffee bar because that is the place where, uh, who, where the wedding lunch was cooked when we were married. And so our Rural Life tour always starts there. Then we go to visit all these different farm people that we've been meeting in this talk. And I found a good amount of asparagus in my walk to Assisi. There's the fortress of Assisi of the 14th century. So at this point, I'm already in the town of Assisi. Now, before we leave asparagus, I have to show you this very brief video because it really gets me laughing. As of 1998, I took my first tour to the United States and I went to lecture on the earthquake. 
And uh, I have done a talk on the earthquake and the restoration of our basilica after the earthquake. And many of you know about it. It was a devastating earthquake. And in 1997, September 26th, there was huge devastation of the basilica. But And they did this. And a video was also taken. Somebody was in there on filming um, the news. And... This video was taken, wait, I moved this, pardon me. And they were making a video um, during the earthquake. They were making a new show. And anyway, it went on film. Well, what happens? Tourism just disappears from Assisi, disappears from Umbria. So I decided somebody's got to go and tell the story, which was damaged to the Basilica, but not damaged to so many of the other wonders of Umbria. So I went off on this lecture tour and I lectured in 20 places all over the States and, um, different people in Assisi helped paid for this trip and a lot of merchants. It was a it was a, a wonderful, really, endeavor. Well, after my lecture tour about the earthquake, I was asked to come back to the places where I'd lecture and lecture again on another subject. And another couple invited me to come and do a cooking class in their home. And I cooked for eight people. And that was 1998, my first cooking class. And then I ended up going every year to do cooking classes in February and March, 30 cooking classes all through the country. People would have in 14 to 18 people to cook. Well, this video I want to show you has something to do with a frittata. One of the recipes on the menu for this cooking event was a frittata. And this cooking event was hosted by my cousin in L.A., Tommy. And he, he, he wrote me then, uh, we didn't have email or whatever. I guess I was corresponding, I don't know, by phone or whatever. And he said, cuz I hate to tell you, but I've got about 20 people. So I'm going to rent our club and we're going to do it there. And I said, okay, whatever works. Well, was I surprised when I saw the equipment and I thought, I cannot do a frittata with this equipment. I had a huge frying pan and a huge lid, but it worked. I have to show you this. And you can hear me saying, I can't do this. This isn't like my lid. Remember the lid I use? Look at this one. <laughs> yeah, I don't do frittatas except my own stuff. I'm ready at this moment. Success. Now, springtime, not just wild asparagus time, but also it is the time we're moving now to the period of the, the summer solstice. And the summer solstice is this passage of time. And according to the ancients, at the time of the summer solstice, all the elements of nature, water, fire, Earth and air were charged with very strong and particular powers. And in fact, the church will take the feast uh, celebrating the goddess of fecundity and fertility and Christianize it, changing the time of the summer solstice, June 24th, to the feast of John the Baptist. And he's very associated with water. So many of our rural traditions in Umbria have associations with water and fire at the end of June. There's the race of the fiery chariots in a little town above Assisi in Grello, also at the time of the Feast of John the Baptist. Well, June 24th was the last day of the Feast of the Goddess Fortuna, celebrating fecundity and fertility. So it has been Christianized, and it becomes the Feast of John the Baptist. And, of course, he's very strongly associated with water, isn't he? He baptized his cousin in the River Jordan. Many, a holy water font or a baptismal font in Italy will have John the Baptist right in the center on the top. We have a bridge across the Tiber River built in the Middle Ages. It no longer exists, which brought the pilgrims from the north to uh, Assisi to worship Francis and they named the bridge after John the Baptist. It's called the town where the bridge is is called Ponte San Giovanni, the bridge of St. John. 
So the night of the feast of St. John, that is the vigil of his feast, June 23rd, is the night when the farmers gather, the farm women gather what's called the cento erbe, the hundred greens, the hundred flowers. And they go out in the countryside and they pick every kind of flower or green you can imagine, especially the ones with great perfume, the yellow broom of which they're going to make brooms later in the summertime after the flowers fall off. Fennel, beautiful, um, strong smell and hint to uh, of spice almost, the wild fennel. The leaves of walnuts uh, are very, very perfumed. Wild mint, and then they put in uh, herbs from their garden, rosemary, sage, laurel leaves always. And this water is kept outside. It can never come inside. It's supposed to take the evening dew, la guazza. And I said to Peppa, why does it have to stay outside? She said, I don't know. My nonna taught me, my his nonna, my great-grandmother. And I think I know why. Because it's going to take the powers of the heavens, if you will, to go into this water. This is a sacred water. And this is our farm neighbor, Olga, and she's smelling her Acqua di San Giovanni, the water of St. John, made with the cento erbe. Here's Peppa sitting near her Acqua di San Giovanni. And I took this photo during a Rural Life Revisited tour. I was with a couple and they booked a tour for June 24th and they were delighted to get in on this tradition. And she was just saying to us, ma che fatica, what uh, labor this was to find all these, you know, flowers and plants. And you can see here she had in her Acqua di San Giovanni, these are walnut leaves. They have a beautiful perfume, the leaves of the walnut tree. This is the couple who was with me on the tour. And Peppa is going to get some of the water. So she's lifting the plants out. And here she's very proudly showing us her Acqua di San Giovanni. And she's getting ready because she wants them to wash in the Acqua di San Giovanni. And you especially wash your face and your eyes because this will assure you health in the new year for your eyes. And she said to them with a grin, your eyes will be safe and healthy all year now. Oh, they were so happy to wash in the water of San Giovanni. And do you know what? That with the sieve, the farm women also will take out all the flowers and then in the water that remains, which is nice, pure, clean water, they will wash children. They'll wash infants. Chiarina told me that they washed each other's backs as well. I said, with a sponge? She said, Anna, we couldn't buy sponges. We never had sponges. She said, an old rag. And I said, why would you wash your back? And she said, it assures good health to your back and to your muscles and to your bones during the year. After we did the wash with the Acqua di San Giovanni, we celebrated with a glass of her red wine and a slice of rocho which she had made, which is a simple cake, and you're going to meet it in just a second, the rocha. And then we stopped to see my farm neighbor, Rita, too, and she showed us her beautiful Acqua di San Giovanni with a hundred greens or flowers, cento erbe, and I was holding some, but I also washed my face and, and my eyes in that. Springtime is the time when there are lots of greens, so I'd also be out every day with my Falce Fienaia. That's this long hay scythe. It's kind of a grim reaper scythe to scythe grass for my rabbits. I had 80 rabbits, so I'd have to scythe at least a bale of greens to feed the rabbits. And sometimes if I was up in the back fields, I'd let the pigs out and they'd come and graze. And they were kind of good company. And it was good for them to graze because that meant they were going to have better tasting prosciutto which would be later that January, and it would be time to slaughter these two little gems, Zsa, Zsa and Fofo, our first two pigs. Let me tell you, after the first two, I never named them. Because if you don't name the pig, you don't have to cry when it's slaughtered. When Zsa, Zsa was turned into prosciutto, capocolo, and salami, I was in our bedroom with a pillow on my head, weeping my heart out. I didn't want to hear the boom. Uh, you know, they're just, um, they have a special gun. They hit them right in the forehead. So it's painless for them. But oh my God, I couldn't imagine. And I couldn't eat sausage, her sausages ever. So, <laughs> And we have a saying here in Umbria, Junio la falci in pugno. 
June, siphon the fist. And this is one of our neighbors at the time of the uh, wheat harvest. There was mechanization for the cutting of the wheat, but if it grew up on a hill, you had to go with a hand scythe because uh, machinery could turn over. And you scythed everything because every single wisp of it was important for as fodder and feed and you know the wheat was used for feeding of the animals and for the flour the family needed here he is this fist here is holding the wheat now if you're ever in a season in june you can see these rotobale and they'll be on in the valley below a sisi and as you look at them, you might not know if they're rotobale, these huge bales, if those are going to be hay or straw. Because the off product, of course, of wheat, oats, and barley is the straw, which is used as bedding for the animals. I asked Pina about this photo, and I said, that's a rotobale. Okay, the rotobale weighs a 1,000 pounds, and it has about as much hay as 20 presses of the, the, the square rectangular bales that they used to make years and years ago. And Pino told me, that's a rotobale of hay, not straw. I said, how do you know? And he said, because it's cut very low to the ground, if it were straw, it would be higher. And I'm going to show you in a minute rotobale of straw. Okay, before they did the rotobale, the pressing, um, they did small presses. Pepe, age 88, is still baling his hay. He bales a thousand bales a year. When I took this photo, he was saying, Que Vittorio, half is done. he done 500 bales. Everybody get your heads around this. He cuts them, loads them onto his tractor trailer, then goes up to the farmhouse and unloads them and stacks them using a ladder. Unbelievable. Still at 88. See the ladders? He climbed these. That's dangerous stuff for someone, 88. Here he is with Gentile when she was well. She's not well now. You met their daughter, if you were with me last week, for the making of the prosciutto capocolo salami. We saw Paola and her husband, Leandro. And one time they used the treja to bring the bales in from the field because to have a cart, you had to have some money because you had to pay a cart rider to make the wheels. The farmers couldn't make the wheels. But they could make the treja, which is a kind of sled, just cutting their trees down and creating a, a sled to bring in the hay from the fields, pulled by their oxen. This, would, this photo would be 1976-77. This is me in 1976 with our farm neighbors Pepe and Mandina. And that is, those are some of the presses of their, or bales, presse in Italian, um, sheaves of hay. And until a few years ago on my Rural Life Revisited tours, when we'd go to visit different farm people like Emma, we might find them with forkfuls of hay, taking them in to feed the oxen. There's Emma about to feed her oxen. Here's Gentile with a big smile, forking uh, hay, to give to their cows, which you can see on the right. We still need hay and we give it to our goats. And we have about 18 goats now. Here's Pino with some of the goats and you can see them here, uh, about to throw the hay over to our goats. And our hay now is in Rotobale and we pay a farm friend who cuts all our hay and creates these rotobale for us. The haying was done in June, and following that would be the mietitura, which is the harvesting or the reaping of the oats, wheats, or barley. And everybody would gather together. You know, mechanization has simplified everybody's life, but everyone laments. We've lost our sense of group unity, being together all day, sweating, drinking wine, uh, sharing the water, sharing the foods, and chanting, singing, sharing the stories.
Now every farm just needs one piece of equipment with one person driving it and a way of life is lost. This was the lead photo when, again, a, just a group event starting at 5.30 in the morning and you would start with Rocha. It uh, depend on who was hosting. You see, we rotated. We did all the haying or the scything at one farm, then went to another. And so we women would help do all the cooking, but we're also out in the fields. I think the women, of course, work the hardest of everybody. You know, while the men are taking a sleep under the oak tree after we've served the roast goose at lunch, the women are up in the kitchen cleaning things up. So things would start at 5.30 with a little bit of rocha, a simple cake, uh, maybe a glass of wine. And then I think around 10.30, it would be time for fava beans. Sometimes with the fava beans would be a little bit of... Um, uh, pork cheek, for example, the barbotza. Peppa said also at this time of morning, about 1030, she said when the, the workers came to our farm, my mama made a little bit of torta formaggio, but she said, not the cheese bread the way we make it now for Easter, Anna, with three kinds of cheeses. It was just with the sheep's milk cheese we had. And there could be sheep's milk cheese and affettate, some little cuts of, you know, sliced meats. And here's Peppa serving some affettate, the sliced meats, to Pino at a dinner at her house not long ago. And here's the rotelbale of straw. And there's the Basilica of St. Francis. This is below Assisi. You see how you can tell now the difference? It's higher uh, what's left on the field is higher. The hay would be cut all the way to the bottom. This is stiffer. It leaves a little bit of a, a how can you say, a raised border, if you will. Okay, I would just like to end with one other uh, summer task, and that is the making of goat's milk cheese, at least in our house. Um, <laughs> I had to put this photo in. This is Pino's favorite goat. His name is Arturo, and the Italians would say he's prepotente, means uh, he's very forceful. He's a male. He butts everybody around. He wants to eat first. Pino's written his name on his horns. The horns say Arturo because Pino says he thinks he's the king, so he's called Arthur. Well, uh, these photos were taken a couple years ago. This is the time when um, Pino's making his cheese. Um, because if the goats are going to give birth, it's generally in the springtime. So the milk is first used uh, for their kids and they'll nurse the kids, of course. We'll raise them. They'll be growing up. And Pina will decide at a certain point that he can take some of the milk uh, to make cheese. It's not necessary any longer for nourishing the kids. And at this time he was, let's see, he was getting about, I'm thinking how many, uh, three liters of milk a day, roughly from milking five. And he would milk, it was always best to milk when it was cooler. And then he would make the cheese. He's putting into the cheese, the milk, into the milk that is to make the cheese, the rennet. And one of his most uh, appreciated birthday presents, his birthday is July 5th, was the year that our son Keegan and his wife Francesca and our daughter Julia and her Guglielmo gave Pino a kit of all the equipment he would need for cheese making and also an instruction booklet on how to make the best cheese. So here's Pino making cheese, with also using his new equipment. And he calls his cheese Caprino, little goats cheese. So I call it il caprino di pino. <laughs> and there he is. He's made four nice forms here. And oh, how delicious is the ricotta. You know, curds and whey. So after you make the cheese, the curds come up out of the way. And that's the delicious, nothing like it, goat's milk ricotta. My favorite breakfast, whole wheat bread toasted, with our fig jam and Pino's goat's milk ricotta on it. Mamma mia. Treat yourself sometime to toasted wheat bread with a good ricotta and a good jam. Or, if I was out of the fig jam, chestnut honey. 
because chestnut honey has a nice little bite to it. It's absolutely delightful. So here I am with the ricotta telling you it's good. If I put both fingers in my cheeks, it would be saying it's delicious. Some of you remember my gestures talk, but I couldn't do delicious because I would have had to put the dish down. I'm telling you that I'm going to make something very good, and that is called pasta with ricotta, with goat's milk ricotta. You can do this with any ricotta you can get. Try to get a very good one. Simply cream the ricotta, mix it a bit till it's creamy. Add some hot water to it. The hot water, uh, which is the water you're using to cook the pasta. We call that the brodo della pasta. And add a little bit. See that gesture? Remember, this is a little. Add a little bit of olive oil. And this also means just a little. A little bit of cheese, either parmigiano or pecorino and stir it into penne pasta and it's absolutely delicious. This is penne pasta with ricotta. And I would like to close with one more rural recipe. Just to get everybody hungry. I think it's your lunch time now. For some people anyway. We're going to learn how to make the sugo del contadino, the sauce of the farm meh farmer and it will have different meats in it so the first thing you want to do is go to a very good butcher and make a selection of the meats this is our butcher here in Assisi and for sugo del contadino you need sausages and pork ribs so Maurizio is giving me sausage and here he's giving me the ribs and then assisting him is Paola, and she's giving me the other meat I need, a chicken thigh. I use this time because I was only going to make this sugo del contadino for about four people. So four slices of lean beef. In the recipe, which Rick will kindly post in the chat, and you can find the recipe on my site, just on the recipes page or whatever, the sugo del contadino, but Rick's going to put it in the chat. I also put that you may use uh, chicken thigh, chicken wings. Sometimes the butcher will give you the back, the head. It doesn't matter. You just want to get a little bit of flavor of the chicken. And they'll all simmer together in the ingredients we're going to tell you about. And Peppa joined us one time at our house. We made together sugo del contadino. So... Uh, here she is with our son Keegan. As some of you have purchased the olive oil from Keegan. And she seasoned our pasta with the sauce. And the meats are going to become the second course, as you'll see. Today we're going to make together a rural recipe of Umbria. What do we mean by a rural recipe? Number one, if it's of Umbria, of course it's of Italy. That is, it must be delicious because you're feeding Italians. Rural cuisine means it must be quick and easy to prepare because the farm woman has to cook, but she also has to go down and slug her pigs, scythe grass for her rabbits, clean her home, etc., etc. So her cooking a meal for the workers at her house must be delicious because you're feeding Italians, but it must be simple and quick to make. A favorite rural dish of the Umbrian farmers is called Sugo del Contadino, the sauce of the farmer. I think it should be called the sauce of the farm woman. Sugo della Contadina. Anyway, let us make that sauce together. Here are the ingredients. The sausage, the lean beef, a chicken thigh or a couple wings, pork ribs. And a few vegetables, garlic, a white onion. They're all going to go in whole, by the way. Celery, the tip is great. Carrot, you don't need even the stalk of the celery, just the part where the leaves are. You'll need extra virgin olive oil. And everything is QB, as much as it takes. The red wine, salt, pepper, and the cheese, parmigiano or pecorino, whatever you prefer. And a quick recipe of the sugo is on my YouTube channel as well. 
and you simmer the beef and the beef bones in red wine for about 20 minutes or even less. Add the ribs and continue simmering. Note, these meats are simmered first as they take longer to cook, the beef and the ribs. If you think you need more red wine, pour it in, why not? It's eventually gonna evaporate. Add the chicken and sausages to the simmering meats. So I'm taking the chicken and I'm gonna add it to the pan in the back there where the beef and the uh, ribs are. And then the vegetables will be added called the odori, the flavors. See, that's just a stalk of celery, the tip. An onion, garlic, carrot, and it's whole. It's going to take the flavor and you don't have to dice everything. And add the tomato sauce. Better if you can have homemade tomato sauce. Otherwise, just buy a very good tomato sauce. And look at how much salt I'm putting in. That's going to be about a tablespoon. It's coarse salt. I would put a tablespoon to start and add more later. Taste it after your sauce is almost made. And extra virgin olive oil, QB. How much did I put in? Maybe half a cup. I'm not sure. Just what looks right. And as mentioned, the YouTube channel has the full recipe. Our sugo del contadino is ready. Now let's see what Pino thinks. Cosa ti sembra? Mmm, non è male. <laughs> Pino sembra says... Sembra buono, chi l'ha fatta? <laughs> He says, I said, very good. He said, looks pretty good. Allora, con parmigiano or senza pino? A little? A little. A little. How's that? A little, a little sprinkle? A little sprinkle. Okay. Hear him speak in English? After our pasta is finished, the second course, along with a vegetable of choice, will be the meat that was the in meat. this sugo del contadino. Let's see what water. Pino thinks of the meat. This is going to be our second course, yes. il secondo piatto. Yes. <laughs> Come ti sembra? It's very, very beautiful. It's Thank so you. Good. It's so good. It will be so good. good. You're talking like a yes, darling. Yes. <laughs> bon appetito. Thank you. So bon appetito, everybody. I hope you'll join us soon at our home for Sugo del Contadino or perhaps making a frittata together. Please come soon to Italy. Thank you very much for being with me. And thanks to all of you who followed me so long, many of you for most of these 40 lectures and have been such staunch supporters and also contributed financially so that the endeavors can continue. And I really wish to continue with rural tales and cooking up rural goodness. And there is the frittata. So thank you very much, everyone.